Welcome to Cloud Radio, made for full-stack cloud operators. Cloud Radio covers all aspects of the business of software. Hi, we've got Claire Sullentrop, who's from Forget the Funnel, and just recently published a very, very popular book called Forget the Funnel. And instead of me giving an introduction, I'll just let her speak for herself. Hey, thanks, Matt. <laughs> yes, we, my partner Gia Georgiana Lotti and I came up with some other, what we thought to be more clever names for the book. But then when we did some public polling and asked our friends and asked our email subscribers, which they preferred, everyone said, you're being overcomplicated. You should just name it Forget the Funnel because it's the name of the business. And we were like, okay, the people have spoken. <laughs> so yes, Forget the Funnel, the book is really the step-by-step -step breakdown of the framework that Gia and I use when we are working with B2B SaaS companies. Companies come to us when they are struggling to figure out how to overcome, you know, maybe flatlining growth or a shift in the market or in some other way are struggling to figure out what's next in terms of their marketing and product growth strategy. So our framework that we have developed over the years of working together, which we have lovingly started to call the customer led growth framework is a, a focused approach to like your, your growth strategy. So it's really the book is a step by step guide to build an impactful strategy and connect the dots between that strategy and then product and marketing teams day to day work. It's got a bunch of case studies, examples, concrete ideas that teams and, and specialists within companies can start to implement on the same day. So we designed it very much to be like a manual, not so much an academic study of marketing marketing and growth. And yeah, I guess, when did it come out? It launched on May 9th. So yeah, we're a little over a month and a half into it being alive. <laughs> Very cool. And who are some of the SaaS companies you work with? Oh man, so many. Just a couple that come to mind, and I'm choosing them because they are featured in the book, are um, SparkToro, which is an audience research tool, AutoBooks, which is a, a finance and, and payment platform for small businesses. Who else is featured in the book? I, it's so funny. I There's so many. And, and then when you ask the question, I like immediately draw a blank. <laughs> And I think it's important for people to know you were director of marketing at Calendly, yes. right, which everyone knows. Yes. And your partner was a senior marketer at Unbound yes. before. So, and throughout the book, there's a lot of impressive SaaS companies in there. So sorry for the- No, thank you. Uh, I appreciate you on the spot. it. No, I, I super appreciate that. And yes, our Gia's and my own SaaS journeys began yeah, years and years ago. Yes, Calendly was my final in-house role and Unbounce was her final in-house role before we switched over into the consulting world. Yeah, and it's when we get into the jobs to be done and things, and the nice thing about Calendly is in the universe of SaaS, it's one of the most well-known, understandable ones. Right. Right. That, you know, you can really relate to the jobs to be done as opposed to some more neat. specialized yeah. <laughs> fleet manager role that right. like, <laughs> one really knows what they do, let alone the software. I have no idea what's in that industry. It's so funny you say that, Matt. I literally just a couple of months ago, we were working with a company that caters to businesses that have fleets of vehicles. So yes, I totally get you on it being like a very specialized <laughs> niche area. For sure, for sure. And throughout the episode, we're going to leverage some quotes from the book. It's probably the easiest way to do it. And I'll read some of them and then we'll get into some follow-ons. And uh, for everyone listening, we'll have the Amazon link, the other bookstore links in the show notes. Again, the book is called Forget the Fun if you're looking to download it while I talk. And we'll go with this one. It kind of stood out to me that I wanted to understand why this problem exists. And here's a quote you have at the beginning. Many marketing teams operate in a haphazard way, endlessly experimenting until something sticks. There is no way to generate long-term growth. In fact, it prevents sustainable and predictable growth. Most marketing teams don't have time to stop look around and ask themselves, why isn't this working? And my question is, can we go deeper here and particularly like, like understand why is there no time? Are people like too focused on KPIs and other metrics or goals that like a lot of this interaction with the customers just can't happen, doesn't happen? Such a good question. And I, I love the quotes that you have kind of pulled out that we'll talk through in this conversation. So as you can imagine, there's, you know, multiple factors that lead to this problem of growth oriented teams not feeling like they ever have enough time. To be lighthearted about it, a friend of mine on a conversation, like just before this one, a friend of mine, he described it as VCs got to get paid. So <laughs> naturally what he meant was there is so many times external pressure on a company, particularly when it is well-funded, to perform and to deliver results 
yesterday. Marketing and, and product folks oftentimes feel like they are rushing to hit particular targets that quarter, that month, that feel unattainable. And so there's this level of stress that, oh my God, we we don't have time to like be super thoughtful about this. Like let's just let's just throw some ideas out there and see what works because we feel like we're coming out the gate already behind. So that level of stress in a in a team environment is one of the factors that leads to this problem. And then another one that leads to this problem is if there's not an existing culture of learning from your of gathering customer insight to inform your decisions, if that culture doesn't already exist within an org, then stopping to gather customer insight so that you can make smarter decisions often is, is a suggestion that meets resistance because it feels like a time-wasting project rather than a, a more strategic approach. So those are two reasons. And if you are in a, a growth practitioner role, whether you're in marketing or in product, honestly, even in sales and customer success, I just default more to the, the marketing and product viewpoints. If you find yourself kind of taking orders, so to speak, from others on the team on, on regarding what your marketing should focus on, if you are leaning on tactics you used in your last job because they worked there for that other product, for that other audience, if you are just pulling from a list of ideas, but none of what you're doing is rooted in an understanding that, yes, this makes sense for our customer and our product, that's a good sign that you might be operating in this haphazard way. I really appreciate that. Like, I think people listening to this, right, are trying to figure something out. They're listening for a reason and, and you laid out some guideposts there. I think another one, just in general, right, what's a guidepost that you're not in your customer heads enough? Is it X months since I last spoke to somebody? Do I know any of our customers? Like just some indicators that someone listening might hear and say, yeah, I really do need to step it up. Yeah, I think if you if you haven't directly spoken to, and spoken to, I'll, I'll qualify in a minute. If you haven't directly spoken to a customer within the past, let's say even six months, that's a, a good sign that you're due to maybe get a little bit closer to your customers day to day. Now, I'm not saying that every six months, you know, a team needs to run a super in-depth research project, but even, let's see, how can I like put some context around this? Let's pretend that actually right now, as we record this, we're getting to the end of this quarter and Q3 is coming up. So it's a good time for, you know, people to be planning and, and thinking about what projects are going to move the needle on the, the, the KPIs they need to hit next quarter. So if you're in that mindset and you're like, okay, we know we want to explore this project and that project and that project from a you know, marketing and, and product growth perspective, a way that you can, without doing a major research project, a way that you can better inform those projects is even to just get on the phone with like maybe two or three customers who would stand to benefit from that work. Customers who are already paying you and are super happy and engaged, since those are the folks you wanna attract more of. If you can get on the phone with just a couple of them and record those calls, and then just share some of the, the most interesting snippets of the conversation with your team, that's a way lower lift way to kind of reacquaint yourself with what's going on in your customers day to day. It doesn't have to be this like huge mammoth project that slows every, everything down. I think this is an important distinction. Are there any substitutes for speaking with the customers? Like mm -hmm. someone might want to just read G2 reviews or, yeah. hey, I joined this community where I can watch the Slack and see what these people are. Or do you specifically have to pick up the phone and interact with them to get the customer head value you guys focus on? Super good question. Wow. Okay. So in a best case scenario, the folks you're learning from are the folks that you want to go attract more of. So that would require that you're speaking with people in your customer base, not out in the world who are, again, actively paying and are happy. They voted with their dollars, <laughs> so to speak, that what you offer them is valuable. So ideally you would be learning from those folks. If not getting on the phone, then at least just running a short survey, potentially. This advice that I'm going to share is like almost 10 years old by now, but it's still very relevant. Benji Hyam, who is one of the co-founders of an SEO agency called Grow and Convert. I've been reading his work for ages and early on in the forming of his agency with his partner, he described a super low hanging fruit way to get insight, like marketing ideas, insight from customers. And he, he was describing that he had come on board as the head of marketing for a young SaaS company. And he just ran a quick survey to existing paying customers saying, Hey, my name's Benji. I just came on board with this company. I'd love to learn a little bit more about like question one, where do you go to learn about our, our industry, like industry topics? Like what are the, do you, what do you read? What 
podcast you listen to? And then number two, like, what are some things you're really interested in learning about related to your work right now? I mean, there was a two question survey and it got him hundreds of responses from his ideal audience, his, his best customers that could then inform the, the marketing work he took on. So if a phone call or series of phone calls feels too intimidating or unrealistic, a survey can be a great sub. Additionally, for some folks who don't have paying customers to learn from, maybe you're super early stage in your company or you are launching, you know, a product to a new audience that is unlike your current audience. Yeah, exactly what you said, Matt, is a great starting point. Reading reviews on G2 or Captera, joining communities where your target audience hangs out. Like those are those are excellent backup options if you don't have current customers to learn from. Okay, that makes perfect sense. I think I don't know if it's the best transition, but another part of the book I liked was about surprises and customer value. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll read an excerpt. Auto books claim to be an all-in-one tool. The research showed that only one feature set actually got small business owners through the door, online invoicing and payment processing. You work with like a pretty broad set of SaaS companies. Mm -hmm. Like, How often do these types of surprises show up that the customer value is really focused in one area as opposed to other areas that the company itself would expect? Honestly, it's nearly every time. Not always, but nearly every time. <laughs> and the reason for that is even folks who, who do have a clear understanding of, of who they serve don't always understand why their best customers chose their product over anything else. So what's a good example of this? You know what? I'll pull another one from the book. There's one chapter, actually, and, and I know you, we can dig further into it with some of the other quotes you shared, but there's one customer we work with that was a marketing automation tool. And they served small businesses. They knew that. They were totally happy, like in the, the SMB market. And they what was really interesting about this company was that they really they had their marketing strategy like locked down. They were producing a ton of content. They had a big budget for paid spend. They were doing webinars. I mean, they they had really invested in marketing. But even with all of that marketing investment, their growth was still pretty flat. They weren't seeing marketing make growth go up and to the right <laughs> as it should be. And so they were like, we know our audience, we're invested in getting in front of our audience. What is missing here? So when we worked with this marketing automation tool, they did find this type of surprise in customer value. We ran a survey, um, as previously mentioned, we, we ran a survey to their small business customers. And what we learned was there were actually two different things that people came to that marketing automation tool to s accomplish. One was businesses that had already in, like figured out their, their marketing channels and were having success, were ready to start to automate some of the low level work of marketing. And then the other one was small businesses that were brand new and were just starting to figure out their marketing strategy for the first time. Let's talk for a second about, you know, the differences in a business that's got marketing figured out and that doesn't. One that has marketing figured out has already understood that marketing will provide a financial payoff. They've already kind of, they, they know which channels are working for them. They clearly have existing demand because they're in the market to pay for tools to streamline their work. They're more likely to be a healthier customer and, and retain long-term versus a business that's brand new, figuring out marketing for the first time. They don't know which channels work for them. They may not even have existing demand for their product yet. So while their needs are a, maybe a bit simpler, they're also more likely to need a lot more handholding and they're not as likely to stick around as long. We don't know if, if their business is even viable. So with that surprise and understanding like, okay, what some people get value from is the automation aspect of our business. And what others get value from is simply that they can start working on their marketing. Like those are two very different types of customer to solve for, even if they both fall into the category of small business. So that's it. That's another, you brought up the autobooks one, which is even though autobooks was very feature filled platform, there were really only two features that mattered for this automation company. They realized once they understood those two different types of small business growing and ready to automate versus just getting started, they were able to look at their marketing strategy and they realized oh, we've really been kind of trying to attract both. Like we, we've been spreading our message across these two different types of customers. It's, it's diluting the impact. So again, I, I know I'm kind of deep in the weeds now, but that's just one of many other examples of this 
customer value being a surprise, even to a team who really did think they knew their customers quite well. That's a great answer. And it kind of builds back up to the funnel, yeah, right? You can cool. picture their funnel finding very, very, very small businesses to slightly more mature. And it's all mixed together right. and you can't really figure out what's happening. But when you work backwards, mm -hmm. you can kind of see... Yeah where you should be building your phone. Absolutely, right. yeah. And the messaging and, you should be using, like getting started with your marketing is not a great message to put out into the world for, for this particular product, right? They wanna be attracting people who have their marketing shit together, so to speak, and are like, no, I, I don't need to get started. I need to level up. Like I need to stop doing low value tasks. So it, yes, it changed where they showed up, kind of where they, they invested their funnel efforts and also how they communicated their value. Interesting. I think this next one transitions well around jobs to be done. And I'll again, read a quote. Step four, pick one job. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest mistakes we see companies at this stage is trying to solve all of their customers' jobs at once. That's because each job can represent vastly different customer needs and priorities. Can you just go deeper here on trying to do too many jobs? Yeah. And I for your customers? I think this, this honestly, this is a perfect question to, to continue on this, the path we, we were on with this marketing automation tool. The small business that had its marketing shit together, so to speak, the job that they need the product to solve for them is remove busy work from my plate. Like I need to focus on higher value things than the basics of marketing versus the newbie type of customer, which is hiring the product because that small business is more like, I need to get my voice out into the world. I don't know if it's going to work, but this tool is, is, is going to help me figure out if it's going to work. Very, very different needs with very different measures of, of, of what is successful. So because previously this marketing automation tool had been trying to speak to both, they were kind of speaking to no one. They were just kind of using this very generic, like we're marketing automation for small businesses type of message. It wasn't super crisp. But once this research came to light, they were able to draw a line in the sand and say, okay, we have no problem with you know newbie businesses coming in. If, if they come in and they, they pay, great. But let's really focus on attracting folks with that, help me level up and automate busy work job to be done. Like we want more of those people. So they changed three pages on their site. They changed their homepage, they changed their features page, and they changed their pricing page to be less about, yay, marketing automation, and much more about, hey, we are for businesses who are ready to automate low-level stuff, level up, be more strategic with what they're doing. And just that marketing messaging change, oh my gosh, I'd have to reopen the book, but the conversion rate from visit to sign up increased vastly. Like they were seeing so much more of a return on investment from their marketing dollars just with that change. So that's the impact of not excluding folks with other jobs to be done from coming into your product, but really prioritizing your efforts around one particular job, if that makes sense. <laughs> that makes sense. And like kind of the devil's advocate, yeah, right, yeah. is if you're a product manager, you're a founder, you're like, if we want to grow to 100 million ARR, like we can't just be doing one Love job. Like yes. That's, like, do you get each job done? How should somebody think about I'm, that tension? Right. I'm totally here for the devil's advocate take. And it's an excellent thing to push back on. It's something that we talk about with teams all the time. Really what focusing on one job helps you do is exactly that. It helps your team focus. And focus and, and maintaining focus is one of the biggest challenges that marketing and product teams face at any given time, particularly when you're within a company where things move very fast, the targets are aggressive and so on. So focusing on one job is super helpful for making sure that at any, for a particular quarter or particular, you know, half year, everyone is, is targeting the same customer segment or the same group of customers. But to your point, once you've optimized, you know, the, the experience for one particular job to be done, then you can go to the next. That actually brings me back to the, the jobs research that I did when I was still in-house at, at Calendly. We did not have an acquisition problem. Thankfully, we were blessed, to, <laughs> so to speak, to have a product that was bringing in tons of free users. So my work, even though my title was director of marketing, my work became much more about activating more of those free users into paying customers. And we did it exactly that way. We ran the research and then we built out an optimized experience for segment A. And once that was done, we went and we worked on segment B and then C and so on. So you can absolutely serve multiple, but trying to fix everything for everyone all at the same time is how you go nowhere. 
<laughs> like that's a really helpful example and particularly with like Calendly, everyone can kind of picture even Super down to the segment level. Like use. sales teams versus, you know, college professors using it for office hours versus, you know, freelancers. Yeah. Like all those people have very different, I mean, at the core, they need to schedule meetings, sure. But there's different elements of the product that make them successful. There's different messaging that works for them. And trying to do it all at the same time is not a recipe for success. <laughs> Well, that, look, that's a, that's a really good answer. Then another part of the book I really enjoyed was the customer value journey and customer mm -hmm. mapping, right? And how that underpins a lot of this. And I'll again read a quote. That's the ultimate goal of the customer-led growth framework, making your customer's experience quantifiable, unambiguous, and the bedrock of your organization. Every department, every team, every decision. Mm -hmm. Anything you want to elaborate on? I want to attribute the customer experience mapping part of our work together. I, I have to attribute that to Gia. She brought that to our business partnership. I brought the research piece. She brought the, the mapping and operationalizing piece. And now that I've seen it, I can't unsee it. Like I, I cannot see any other way to help a team get on the same page and, and stay on the same page as they scale. <laughs> and I'm happy to elaborate if that is useful. <laughs> And I guess like the devil's advocate yeah. to this is like some people are like, all right, with something like Calendly, mm -hmm. it lends itself to, you know, all these product analytics of first activation, right. five meetings booked. But then there's other people in just other types of software that might be like our product isn't very quantifiable. Mm -hmm. Like it's, what do you have to say to somebody who's kind of trying to get away from having to do this work? My first question would be why? <laughs> And the reason I say that is, so in the framework, the steps of the framework involve choosing a particular problem you want to solve for, a growth problem, and then learning from your happy, paying, super engaged customers, people who have gotten through, you know, your, your marketing materials and maybe a sales flow and a sign up, people who've gotten all the way through that and they're, they're lifers. They are, they love what you're doing, learning from them, how they went through that journey and then kind of reverse engineering that journey to bring in more of them. So I say all that because the building of a customer experience map, once you've learned from those folks is really building a tool that enables your marketing, your sales, your product, and your customer success teams to all visually see and agree on what role they play across that experience. So it's a it creates clarity and, and helps people understand where their work intersects. And it also gives people a shared set of metrics to agree are important. So rather than, let's use the example of like, I'm actually working with a SaaS company right now that has a bit of a data problem. They're honestly in this experience where they're like, we don't really know how to quantify our customer's experience because it's all in the salespeople's heads. They're attempting to implement some metrics that everyone can work towards. So they're starting with lead and then MQL and SQL. And in a conversation with their sales and marketing, heads of sales and marketing, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I was like, okay, okay, okay. So I want to make sure we're, we all agree what these marketing metrics, what these metrics mean so that we can make sure we're driving the right people in. So we've got lead, what defines a lead and, and where the team landed was, well, that's when someone either signs up for a demo, like, like request a demo from our website, or they respond to a sales email saying, yes, I'd like a demo. I'm like, okay, great. We got lead. Now MQL, marketing qualified lead. How is that different? And the team was like, mm, we don't really know. And I was like, okay, well, how about sales qualified lead? How, what's the difference between lead and sales qualified lead? And they're like, uh, well, sometimes it means that they've had the demo call and they're ready to move to the account exec, but not always. And, and it was just a really fascinating conversation because these are smart people. It's, it's not like anyone was being stupid, but there was clearly a lack of ability to your point. There was a lack of ability to quantify the experience and it was making things so hard from not just a measuring standpoint, but also from a standpoint of understanding what was work, what marketing was working, what sales was working. I say all that to say, it can feel very real that you have a customer journey that might not be quantifiable, but that might be because nobody has really dug in to do the work of sitting down with a customer and unpacking how many stages, how many steps they took to become a paying customer. That's interesting. Like, so what you're advocating too, is I have been thinking of this, like kind of on the, you know, product yeah. like led growth type of things where there's things you can measure within the product, but 
your framework also works for the sales oh. process, right? You're saying you want to interview customers and, and map mm -hmm. out, you know, the demo to the account, or at least all of these situations mm -hmm. to kind of better build your sales totally. machine? It, it definitely can span all the way from marketing to sales into product. You know, for it, I would say that it's more often sales, like organizations that include a sales component do have a tougher time at this because the buying process is longer and it's a little windier. But imagine the value of taking five of your best customers, I'm even just going to stick with five, getting on a call with you know the, the person in that organization who was the champion buyer. They felt the pain, they requested the demo, they went through the whole process because they needed this product that badly. Imagine the value of being like, okay, I've got a whiteboard in front of me as I talk to you, customer, and I'm, I'm writing the steps down. So you said you Googled, okay, so go they Googled, they got to the website, they hit demo request, they got on the demo, okay, what happened next? Okay, you got on another call with some of their stakeholders. Okay, what happened next? Okay, you got a proposal. Okay, then what? Okay, then you had to go run through legal. Okay, then what happened? Then we did a, a proof of concept. Okay, then what happened? And if you do that with five, a minimum of, of even five of your, your best customers, you're gonna start to see what the commonalities in those steps really are. And you can start to use, even if, even if you don't use every single step, well, essentially what that begins to give you is more clarity on what stages most people will have to go through in your funnel or, or sales machine, so to speak. And you can get some proxy metrics, I should say, for the customer getting enough value to push through to each stage. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. This is very helpful, like in okay. terms of seeing the benefits and just kind of how your framework really works like backwards and yeah. forwards. And, and it kind of, you know, when we get into all of this and like the original quote I jumped off with that, you know, again, the ultimate goal of the customer led growth mm -hmm. framework, making your customer's experience quantifiable, unambiguous, and the bedrock of your organization, every department, every team, and every right. decision. And my perception, like from reading through, you know, the book materials would be that your best chance of all of this sticking is if this is initiated by a founder or CEO. Is that it right? It definitely has more staying power if there's someone on the leadership team who has put their, their stamp of approval on the work, for sure. It can be valuable even just within you know one department or a couple people cross-functionally. It can be valuable, but making it this company-wide tool usually does involve you know the CEO or the, the COO or the founder saying, no, we, we're all getting on board with this thing. That can be challenging in bigger orgs, which is why I say, you know, it can help even to just start within one department and then slowly expand it out from there. But, you know, best case scenario, we're all starting with customer research from the beginning, which doesn't always happen. <laughs> Makes sense. And like, let's just use that to transition to some just tactical, mm -hmm. like yep. implementing things. Like how long do these insights last? Like, do you, is it like a big strategic plan that, you know, you kind of get 18, 24 months out of, or I, like how long should you yeah. wait? benefit from this type of work. super love this question and i just looking at our notes i'm seeing like you know is this an ongoing project or is it something that you do every once in a while how would i think about that also i like your phrase like the half-life of the findings how long do they last when do you refresh them so some of this really the answer is going to depend on a couple of things one it's going to depend on what's pushing you to take the project on so what i mean by that is usually like the the easiest in the easiest way to start the to start the framework is not to say this is an org change like everything we do is going to shift but to start with something much smaller for example identifying an existing metric that you're measuring that is underperforming some really common ones that teams some some really common pain points co companies feel when they work with us are hey we're investing in marketing but we're not seeing the payoff and we don't know what to do. And, and, and when we talk through with what that means with them, usually what they really mean is we're driving a bunch of traffic to our site, but it's very little of it is converting to signups. We're getting a bunch of signups, but very few of them are converting to paid. So like we've done the work of bringing in the people, 
but the people aren't staying. Why aren't the people staying? Those become very measurable things that you can choose to fix. Our website conversion rate or our trial to paid conversion rate. So if you start with something like that, rather than saying this is going to be an org wide change, um, you have a more immediate kind of end goal in mind. So how long does the process take, I guess, is, is what I get, ne get to next. That's so dependent on <laughs> How well set up your team is to run research versus not. When we work with teams, we've got, we've whittled it down to being about a six week project between, you know, learning everything we can about the, the product, learning from customers, and then like working with the team to apply those learnings to mapping their experience and, and figuring out what, what to fix. For folks who don't do this work every day, day in and day out, it can be more of like a quarter long project in really big, big organizations where there's tons and tons of, you know, red tape, it can be more of like a full year project. But depending on who you have on your team, you can actually get it done quite quickly. It doesn't have to be this massive effort. The six weeks is very encouraging. And I guess I assume that's when they work with you as a consultant. Usually when they need they need the answers ASAP, that is what leads someone to come to us rather than saying, hey, we're going to do this in-house. Some teams do choose to do it in-house. There's a wonderful CEO and founder of a product called Knowledge Owl. It's a help doc, it's like knowledge based platform. CEO's name is Mary Beth, and it's a pretty small team. And she wanted her team to, she had the opportunity to work with us, but she was like, number one, I, I'm not sure that the budget is there. I'm, I'm a little worried about that financially, but also I want my team to learn to do this. And we have the luxury of not being in a huge rush. And for them, it's taken about a year, but now the team knows how to do it. Now they can repeat it more quickly, and they've chosen to embed this into their organization. So that's one option. When you need to move fast, yes, that's when people work with us. <laughs> so what is the ideal customer profile of someone looking to work with Forget the Funnel as a consultant? Okay, I'll try to keep this concise. We have worked with self-funded companies that are super early stage or are, you know, at their first one to two million ARR. And we've also worked with companies with thousands of employees at 50 plus million ARR. So it runs the gamut, but where we can really provide a ton of value is if your team is still relatively small. And what I mean by that is there's a, a leadership team that's a CEO or a founder or co-founders, and there are some in-house practitioners on the ground. So whether the founder or CEO is acting as head of product, or maybe they have their, their initial head of product, a head of marketing, a head of growth, you've got a couple of people in there who are starting to do that work, but your team isn't so big that that each department, you know, has a bunch of specialists in it. So when the team is small, but the, the customer base is quite large in comparison, that's a really, really good sign that someone like us can, can help your team rapidly accelerate their performance against growth revenue targets. So revenue wise, that can be all over the place, but oftentimes it's folks who are between there, like for two to 10 million ARR or a little bit above that. So maybe two to 20 million. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Like that sounds good because people have limited bandwidth and just want to get yeah. a sense of what's realistic. And it, it, that's a good answer. Two to, Two to 20, 20 is... smaller, small ish team size, large ish customer volume. <laughs> Makes sense. Well, very cool. And look, this, this is an excellent book. I got some great insights yeah. out of it. I think there's even some things here for investors, right? Like the customer value surprise, doing too many jobs, and then just looking at when you're assessing a management team, like how customer totally. focused are they? Because that's like the one theme that weaves throughout this book is it all comes back totally. to customer value. So look, this has been a great show in the show notes. We'll have all your socials, the book, your consultancy, and we hope people take advantage of those. And thank you oh again God, for joining. Matt, thank you so much for having me on. And thank you for the kind words about the book. I'm glad that you found value in it. That was the whole goal in writing it. We got super happy and uh, humbled to be here. Mm -hmm.